we've talked about when you bring participants into a study, they may, uh, if they know, if they guess at or are told what the purpose of the study is, they may change their behavior as a result of that knowledge. That's what we call, if you remember, that's what we call reactivity. And so because of that, we will sometimes uh, restrict the amount of information we give to them. We will sometimes do what is called a blind study. If you recall, a double blind study is where both the researcher and the participant are blind to certain information about what's going to happen so that that information does not influence their behavior, so that we remove the effects of that person's bias on the results of the study. In some cases, we even go so far as to engage in outright especially in psychology, particularly in social psychology, we may engage in outright deception. So, um, so a classic example of that would be the, in the Milgram study. The Milgram studied, wanted to study obedience. He wanted to see how obedient someone would be, but he didn't tell them that because if he told them that, then they would have said, well, I'm not going to you know, o- obey this researcher. I'm just going to do what I want. I, I don't just listen to whoever tells me what to do. If someone tells me to do a bad thing, I, I listen to my internal morals instead. And so if people had known the purpose of Milgram's study, they would have had a great deal of reactivity, and it probably would have invalidated the results. So Milgram chose to engage in deception. He told his uh, participants that it was a study having to do with learning and memory. So there's this, uh, there's this potential conflict in research that is a very common thing that we run into between, between the informed consent right, and the potential for reactivity, that we want to support a person's autonomy by giving them total information about what's going to happen to them, uh, yet, we also want to restrict the information if, in certain cases where that would cause reactivity. So this is not something that is black and white. We have to try to strike a balance here. Um, in particular, we want to make sure that if we're not giving complete information, that we are justifying that, that there are good reasons for that. Uh, so there are certain principles that we've come up with over the years for if you're giving incomplete information. So if you're engaging in deception or you're just in any way giving incomplete information, what are the things that you need to do to to make that justified, make sure that's that's okay? Uh, The first thing is that you should be sure that this is, I'm, I'm going to put this in my own words here, sort of abbreviate what you'll see in some of these ethics codes. Um, but I'm going to say it should be truly necessary. In other words, there is no other reasonable way to get these same results, to to probe this particular question or hypothesis that you've got. There is no other way. If there were another way that didn't involve deception, then of course you should engage in that way. Um, if, if I say deception, but any kind of, you know, just not giving the person all the information. If there's a way to do it where you can give complete information for that informed consent, go with that way instead. Um, the other thing I'll add to this is that it should be it should be justified in the sense that it should be worth it. It should be this there should be um, this goes back to the idea of weighing the costs and the benefits. There should be a high enough, uh, you know, there should be good reasons from past research or your own reasoning to conclude that this is likely to to yield substantial benefits for the participant or for uh, society or for our knowledge in terms of, of understanding this uh, topic, that that will yield enough benefit to justify the risk that you're undergoing by not giving this person complete information. The second thing is that even though you're not giving them complete information, you really, you must still uh, inform them about certain things. You must still inform them about the risks and benefits. This, like I said earlier, this is the most important part of the idea of how we support a person's autonomy. They need to know, they don't necessarily need to know the exact details of what you're going to do. That may not matter to them too much. Uh, But 
they if you're if you're not giving them details that have to do with a substantial risk for psychological or physical harm then that's a real issue that really threatens their autonomy and that is one of the main elements of when people debate things like the milgram study and say milgram should not have done that to these participants the idea is that there was more risk than than was uh, really considered there was more risk uh, of psychological harm of the of the uh, participants uh, really feeling ashamed or or being traumatized by believing that they had shocked these other uh, uh, people in some cases believing that they had shocked them until they died now, even though that didn't actually happen, just the experience of going through that could be substantially traumatic. And so that's a real uh, substantial risk to undergo. And they were not uh, informed of the risks, and they weren't even informed of the level of risk that they would undergo in the study. So in particular, you want to make sure you're being clear about the level of risk. So most commonly, in anything that you would be doing as an undergraduate, you are most often, in your informed consent, be talking about the level of risk with a statement like, uh, the, the risk of participating in this study is, is estimated to be comparable to that which you would encounter in everyday life. Because most of the studies we do, even with something where we're, we're putting the, uh, the participant under some level of stress, well, they experience some level of stress in their everyday lives. So, so that's not unreasonable. It's not an unreasonable level of risk. And we can, we can f be justified if, if the study is likely to yield substantial benefit. We can be justified in being somewhat vague with what we tell them and not giving them the exact details. Uh, not telling them, for example, you will be uh, told to do a bunch of math problems in front of, uh, in front of a, another, uh, in front of the researcher, uh, in order to stress you out. We can, if we tell them that, it might mess up our study. So we can tell them something more general, uh, because the risk of, uh, of of any real harm is still quite minimal in that case. The third thing that you want to do here, though, when you're giving incomplete information, is to do with debriefing and the idea is you want to thoroughly debrief this is where the debriefing procedure is especially important to sit with the participants and make sure that you have cleared up any confusion that you have filled in the holes in the information they had so whatever incomplete you know in whatever way the information was incomplete you have now made it complete so that they leave uh, the study understanding exactly what happened to them and what it meant so they don't have any, um, you know, sometimes there's, there's a lot of potential harm that can be done simply from the participant being uncertain of why they went through what they went through. What did that mean? Was that a reflection of my ability? So, for example, in some uh, studies, they will uh, give participants puzzles uh, that are impossible to solve and present them to the participant and say, you have to solve this puzzle, you know, and the, the participant struggles with it for ages and they maybe feel stupid because they just cannot get an answer to this thing. When you do the debriefing, it is especially important that you tell the participants this was an impossible puzzle that was presented to you so that we would be able to study how you and other people coped with that kind of a challenge, with the potential for failure. Um, so this is no, in no way a reflection of your ability or your worth as a person. Giving the participant those kinds of statements uh, during the debriefing is really important so that they don't have any misconceptions that could uh, cause lasting uh, negative harm to them. So again, what we see with a lot of these ethical principles is there, there, there's going to, there's not going to be a black and white answer of okay, uh, you, you have this is what you must include in your informed consent, or this is when leaving something out is justified. That's a decision that has to be made, um, keeping in mind the underlying principle uh, that we're trying to protect the person's autonomy and ability to choose. Um, but we, that we have to in some way weigh, again, just like we saw before, we have to weigh the potential risks and benefits uh, involved to see uh, what we think is a, is a good way to proceed.